You describe yourself as a creationist. What do you mean by that term? A creationist is a much distorted term. In the media usage and in the propaganda usage of the scientific establishment, it means only a believer in literal genesis. And it, that's then a term for ridicule. So the, the, the propaganda message is that everybody that doesn't agree with us is over in that other camp, and then we'll talk about Noah's Ark and so on and, and ridicule it, and we'll be able to get rid of them. But in um, the proper usage, a creationist is simply somebody who believes in the existence of a creator. That would be something like 85% of the American public, maybe even more. Um, uh, that is to say, the creator may have created uh, recently and suddenly, or may have created over a very long period of billions of years through a gradual process. That's a question of detail. Um, the important point is that a purposeful intelligence was doing the creating by whatever uh, method. Uh, so that what the um, scientific establishment tends to do is to say that, well, first place, we'll put everybody in that group into a very narrow box, and then we'll dispose of them by ridicule. And then having got rid of all our enemies by that set of language tricks and propaganda mechanisms, we'll say the only thing left is us, so everybody is supposed to believe the way we do. That's what they call the scientific method these days, and it's just a, a, a very reprehensible kind of propaganda. If science is limited to naturalism, what possible alternatives could exist to evolutionism? Well, certainly. Uh, one of the alternatives is that the full truth about origins is simply not accessible to the kind of science that we do today. Now, to suggest that, of course, enrages um, a certain kind of scientist, although actually the majority of scientists aren't bothered by the idea at all. But the ideologues who promote things like Darwinism or theories of everything are enraged by that. Uh, but it's very much um, like uh, the experience with science in the Middle Ages. You know, the, the alchemists thought that they could make lead into gold, and it was beyond the purview of their science. Well, the uh, same thing is that our alchemists of today think that you can take non-living chemicals and leave them alone, just stir them up in a broth, and life emerges, and then you wait long enough, you get human beings. It's, I think it's the alchemy of, uh, of today. Uh, so, so one thing we really ought to consider is that um, uh, the kind, at least the kind of science that we do today can't tell the full truth about origins. Um, and what our science ought to be doing is learning more about how the life forms actually work, uh, what they are, freeing themselves of the blinkers of Darwinian prejudice so that they can uh, understand more about what they are, just like the alchemists learned, needed to learn more about chemistry. They needed to learn about the difference between elements and compounds and so on before they could understand why they couldn't turn lead into gold. I think the same thing would happen if our scientists started to study the life forms without this materialist uh, set of uh, uh, blinders on, and uh, they discovered that it was something that required uh, the input of intelligence into the system uh, to be viable. You know, dissent that's still happening among, you know, far-looking researchers. However, a lot of the researchers that you're probably citing have faith that the answers to these questions lie in the evolutionary theory in you know, areas that Darwin may not have seen, but you know, still see the answers as lying along that track. Why do your questions, why do the holes that you state go to prove any alternative evolutionary theory more than, hmm. I mean, how do they at all support yeah. creationism as opposed to a revisionist evolutionary theory. She's asking you to fill in the blank yeah, of sure. the mechanism of evolution. Well, why should I even be interested in doing that? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, what you're asking is for me, blank, to, blank, is for me to, to join the other side and become a promoter of some half-baked naturalistic scenario for the history of life. Whereas my whole point is to tell you that these are half-baked scenarios and I don't believe any of them. Uh, what, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, see, this, this idea, you're supposed to promote a naturalistic alternative and be in our business, otherwise you have no standing, that's what keeps this system from crumbling of its own uh, accord, is because of, of rules like that. Um, and then it's promoted to the public as the creation story um, that everybody's supposed to believe and found their ethics on. Why should we? 
but you state that there's a lack of empiricism in evolutionary theory, that there's some, you know, there are questions left, on, you know, questions that still need to be answered and stuff like that, but you don't have any empirical evidence that creationism is true. Yeah, well, what do we mean by creationism? There's loads of empirical evidence mm. that there is, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Richard Dawkins begins his book, The Blind Watchmaker, the most vociferous argument for atheism in the guise of bi biology that you can find, by saying that living organ biology is the study of extremely complicated things that look as if they were designed by a creator for a purpose. Uh, and in particular, he, go he goes on to concede that even a, a single cell contains genetic information that exceeds the information content of all the volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, put together, or a CD-ROM, or whatever you, you, you want, want to say. Now, then he says that's an illusion because we know that mutation and selection can do the whole job. But if you look at the evidence and you see how much that's just assumption and presumption, and it's downright against the evidence of the fossil record, and it isn't established at any Anywhere, then you realize you're back to square one. In the words of Richard Dawkins, <laughs> biology is the study of extremely complicated things that appear to have been designed by a creator for a purpose. Let's look again at Phil's views. Phil is a born again Christian. He believes that God exists, that God created life, and apparently successively created the major forms of life. God's design is apparent in the adaptations of animals and plants. God created humans separately because humans and chimpanzees do not share a common ancestor. God gives us life after death. And God gives us an absolute foundation for ethics. God gives us ultimate meaning in life. God gives humans free will and thus the possibility of genuine moral understanding and responsibility. Now when it comes to the important questions, Phil has a very clear maxim, which is maximize your leaps of faith. Get them as big as you possibly can. Will has a maxim too. Minimize your leaps of faith is my argument, and that way you can actually live in a natural world. And when you die, you're not going to be surprised because you're going to be completely dead. Now me, now me, if I, if I live after I'm dead, I'm going to be really, really surprised. But at least, at least, I'm going to go to hell where I won't have all those grinning preachers from Sunday morning with me. But at least, at least, I'm going to go to hell where I won't have all those grinning preachers from Sunday morning with me. <laughs> Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear, and I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposive forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. That's just all that's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. What an unintelligible idea. Now, again, I do not set as my goal in a talk like that convincing people in the audience who may be convinced of, of a, 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 uh, the opposing point of view to change their minds overnight. I don't think that's the way that change happens. What I want to convince you of is this. The people who doubt the truths of Darwinian evolution, who doubt that accumulation of micromutations through natural selection can build complex plants and animals from single-celled predecessors, who doubt that anybody knows how the specific human qualities of consciousness and intelligent purpose could have arisen. These are people who doubt for valid scientific reasons based on the evidence. And what has been going on in the past century is a steamroller. And you get the tone of the steamroller in the way that Will argues, uh, uh, friendly though he is, uh, <laughs> that the purpose, the purpose is to overwhelm the dissent. And I want you to understand that that won't work. 
More and more details are coming out, more and more of the new research in embryology and uh, molecular evolution is simply generating more problems, and it's recognized by the most uh, far-sighted people in the theory. This is going, we're going to have to come to grips with this, and I believe that as soon as we can get the debate open in the universities and out on the table, the kind of evolution that Will Provine is preaching is going to collapse, not because people like me are going to do it, but because the scientists themselves uh, will see that they, they can't go on with it. In this video, we see the tactics often used by evolutionists of attacking personally rather than sticking to the facts as Professor Johnson does throughout this debate. We also see that it seems more important to Professor Provine that he has a theory that disproves the existence of God rather than one that explains how life developed. Professor Provine states that if Darwinian evolution is true, then it implies that there is no God. I fail to see any connection between the two, but would suggest it reveals a tendency to draw wrong conclusions. As Professor Johnson would say, his logic is terrible, but might indicate some of Professor Provine's true motivation. Professor Provine seems very happy that he thinks there is no God, and actually seems to rejoice at all the implications that go along with no God. To me, a thinking person would be in despair. It is truly frightening to me how he mocks hell. Evolutionists scream, no religion in science classrooms but they sure aren't afraid to discuss their own religious conclusions. The more I study this issue and what truly motivates evolutionists, the more I realize many really don't want there to be a God, and their evaluation of any facts will reflect this bias. This is truly a spiritual battle, not a scientific battle. The theory evolutionists defend so vigorously is nothing more than wishful thinking, and the implications they derive from it reveal their bias. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Claiming to be wise, they became fools.